Hello. Hello, uh, Hussein and Adama and Morgan. So uh, I don't know if people wanted to start right in, uh, maybe give an update or any questions or comments. Hello. Hi. Uh, so I do have uh, some updates, and I have a question as well. Okay. Um, for the update, so I think I finished to make the um, the whole environment. Um, now I'm looking for some resources to to create the code digital in Unity. And um, yeah, so my question uh, is, uh, do you have some advice or so some um, some uh, resources uh, for me to create this code digital? A simple code digital on Unity, and yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, all right. I don't know. Hussein, do you know of anything like that? What, what did you ask? Uh, I think. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, I just asked if uh, someone has some resources or some advice to create a little code digital in, um, in Unity. Uh, no, I don't think I can give advice on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't know either. I thought if anyone would know, it'd be Hussein. So, but okay. otherwise, your your project is coming along fine. I mean, oh you... yeah, I don't have a uh, bunch of problems. Okay. Um, I'm still figuring out um for the very uh, the very environment and some um, some interaction. But I uh, managed to to make some drive and drag and drop. So now I have to to begin to create the the rules and uh, the code digital and some other things. Yeah, it sounds good. But otherwise, I I, I have some ideas. So it's okay. It's, it's worth just in case of uh, someone has some advice. Okay. Uh, Morgan says, uh, you might join us at CogLab where there are some other VR researchers. So there's a, uh, I guess Morgan is involved in a group, CogLab, that has like a, some more VR people. CogLab yeah. France, which is where you are. Uh, right? Yeah. Yes, I checked for the CogLab, but unfortunately I'm working while it's, um, uh, um, was our uh, the the complete case, so um, yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, that sounds good. Thank you, Adama. You're welcome. Did we have any other updates? Yes. Hello. Hello. Um, uh, yeah. So um, uh, I uh, I wasn't able to present last week. Uh, as I had my friends, uh, so like uh, the first two weeks of the coding period, I've kind of uh, I've put up a blog in the chat uh, that I've written recording the progress of uh, what I've done throughout in these two weeks. Uh, one that I did a little bit in advance, uh, and um, yeah, it includes the design that I presented uh, the week before last. Uh, and as well as I started on some initial code, uh, like the initial coding, um, kind of uh, trying to build up the initial agents for the process, uh, for the framework, like what kind of, uh, basically it's just currently I'm, um, just trying to get a sense of what kind of obstacles I might, uh, you know, come across and also uh, kind of what exactly are the LLMs capable of and what I can get them to do. Yeah, so this is like uh, kind of what I was uh, working on uh, this week, having completed the design. So basically, like, 
um, even in my blog, I have kind of gone through the various frameworks that I evaluated as to like once I finalized my design requirements, what exactly I would need. And so I've decided to go with uh, these two for now, like Langchain, which is very popular for uh, using LLMs, and Olama, which is kind of a local uh, execution engine that allows me to run uh, LLMs locally on my machine. And then I basically tested out these two models that I was aiming to use, and they work well on my machine. Uh, both of them are not quite heavy computationally. Uh, so right now for like simple tasks, they are definitely possible. And then next I wanted to kind of understand these models capabilities. Uh, so the main uh, two things that uh, these uh, LLM models should be able to do to be able to become uh, agents sort of in our uh, framework is uh, have the ability for coding and like not just coding, but uh, kind of coding in the open source environment so as to like understanding GitHub issues and understanding pre-written code and uh, adapting to it. And then the next would be conversation. So for the first point, like uh, basically uh, in the environment, eventually when I create a contributor agent, uh, agent who is a contributor in open source ecosystem, uh, that agent will not just have to write code, but perform many actions like summarizing the issue and then planning out a, a structure and based on the planned out structure, write code for every step and then summarize everything in a pull request and submit it for review and the likes. So uh, basically, initially I did some... Uh, I did some tests to just kind of understand the coding abilities. So like here is a simple code written by one of these LLMs for uh, testing or uh, for using or uh, getting uh, the current weather. And then something simple such as using a calculator. So then of course here we understand that um, uh, one is very simple, like writing a normal code using basic libraries and one is trying to use documentation and uh, APIs and such. So now if it's not given access to any other tools, it kind of gives something which is empty and not really workable. Uh, like it does not add a key or how exactly, but it tries to emulate it. Uh, so uh, this like was one of the purposes of understanding was like what Will I need to augment these LLMs with to make them agents? So one of them is kind of access to the web or access to some kind of API keys or something, or at least the like them believing that they have those keys in our simulation. And then the next thing was uh, kind of uh, what I tried to do was uh, make it do all those uh, parts, like understanding everything from an issue to getting it to a pull request. So like, uh, like here is an example of basically a, a, a sam what a sample GitHub issue might look like. And then like I asked the LLM to basically go through everything, summarizing the issue, uh, planning out an approach uh, step by step. Now, of course, this is a very high level issue where it just says create this. So such its uh, steps are also high level where it says choose the web framework and implement this and implement that. Uh, eventually, they should uh, like uh, using uh, prompt tuning, which I've already implemented a bit, but basically trying to get it to hone into like specific things, uh, like say designing something or writing the code for something. And then uh, what I basically implemented was that uh, for any of these steps, whichever steps require code for those, it can call code. So what it has done is written like two functions over here. Like it has planned out everything and written the code itself. And this is kind of, it's not a very readable format, but it is a code that it has written uh, to kind of bring that uh, plan to life of quick making a blogging website using Flask in Django. And then once, and then it, kind of tries to summarize everything in a pull request format. 
and then like with contributor agents like this you can also make reviewer agents that kind of review this code and they can converse and such and then the next thing that i'm currently working on uh, so this basically like my current assessment is that these llms are pretty much capable of these things all they need is uh, some prompts to understand what they need to do and like some functions that for example i've created here as to what they should do next like first they should plan it out then based on the steps they should write the code create the pull request so just with those kind of uh, this they will be able to do this uh, they'll be able to become a efficient contributor agent uh, but the next thing is to kind of which was one of the sub tasks uh, it will come in later uh, but i just kind of wanted to understand what kind of problems i may face uh, while trying to implement this and that is the conversation ability uh, basically the uh, where they kind of see the past history of everything and are able to converse to each other which would be quite essential in an open source environment so uh, for that uh, i wanted to implement retrieval augmented generation and i'm still working on this i'm trying to use langchain and chroma db for as my vector store and i'm uh, getting some errors right now i'm trying to uh, finesse it and i did also come across some issues like so i thought of using slack as a uh kind of uh, base of what the conversation history might look like for the agent and then it can build on that so for that uh, it is possible but then i'll require permissions to enter whichever workspace we are uh, wanting to emulate so that is one thing that uh i need to keep in mind and kind of design around it and then the next thing is the actual like coding nitty gritty is uh, as i said i'm facing some errors in the kind of embeddings that i'm trying to use so uh, i'm just uh, trying to figure that out and uh, this is like one of the later stages so uh, i think i'll try to work on this till uh, around sunday and as this is kind of the preliminary requirement stage and then my plan for the next week was to begin building the framework uh, the agents which i kind of have a basic structure for and start building on the interactions that they will have with the environment and each other so i'll hopefully like start on that from next week yeah. um and yeah if this is uh, like well if i can get retrieval augmented generation to work right now it'll be great Uh, in case i don't i plan to keep it as a little sub task or for some time later and uh, get on with like the basic structure first yeah that's great uh thank you for that update uh so you're using a llama uh for your llm and you're also using langchain what's the difference between the two wasn't uh, sure so yeah so llama is basically just an execution engine that kind of allows me to run the llm locally so basically like uh, when we use open ai uh, it's running on a server somewhere and we just get the api sure there is no api involved i have the weights and the model uh, and it is executing on my local machine so what olama does is it just like uh, kind of uh, bundles everything up very easily like ideally if i was to run a model any machine learning model i would have to executed via pytorch get the weights and run it and uh, first of all i would also not be very efficient and the main problem being that these models are so huge that they are uh, gbs they are in gbs their size so what olama does is quantization where it kind of uh, everything is four bit quantized uh, where um, Uh, like the weights when they are stored instead of being stored as floating points they are stored as four bit integers and uh, because of that the size of the models reduces dramatically so the models that i have running mistral 7b and uh, uh llama 3 which are both like really great models and um, and uh, like because of llama they are currently around the size of uh, around 7 gb i believe so uh what it yeah 4.7 gb 
so it is uh, because of the quantization it is allowing me to get almost the same performance but running it locally and langchain whereas is just this kind of framework it is originally built to allow uh, operations uh, like chaining operations using llms uh, basically like once it does this then it can do that kind of uh, but i'm not exactly using it for that purpose my main purpose of using it is a lot of features that are implemented in various papers like even something that the generative agents paper came up with which was like a weighted vector store retriever langchain has specific implementations for that so using langchain all i can do is say tell it that uh, use this model that i have hosted locally what it uh, like when i host this model locally all it does is uh, makes a local host api and uh, pushes the answer there and then so that is one of the reasons i'm using langchain to kind of query this uh, local host or uh, api that i have via olama and the second reason is for its various features like all of these imports so it's uh, basically its integration with chroma db which is a vector store which is there to uh, keep embeddings like uh, once uh, if i want to since the reason the whole reason i'm planning to use retrieval augmented generation is uh, if i want my llm to know all the past context in a conversation it becomes too much to give it uh, in its initial prompt uh, which consists of something called context length i explain this a bit in my blog as well so most of the models that i'm using have a context length of 8000 and the maximum i can go to is 32000 whereas all these other papers that i'm referring use gpt4 uh, which has a context length of 128000 so there is quite a huge difference there and because i don't have the luxury of that context length uh, i have to use a retrieval augmented generation which is basically a uh, kind of storing everything in a database instead of giving it giving the llm that in a prompt and telling the llm that according to your query whatever you think is relevant uh, query that database so for that it is stored in uh, embeddings in a vector store so that is chroma db so what langchain has is this easy integrations with all of these different tools that i want to use it i can easily just import olama i can import chroma i can import the embeddings this is what i'm struggling with i'm i'm trying to i've tried like three different embeddings and i'm trying to find one that works uh, but basically it has this huge like community support of a lot of, of features so that is currently my main uh, usage for it and i'm hoping to build my agents kind of from scratch uh, because the more frameworks i introduce the more uh, computationally intensive i make it so uh, building on the other papers that i referred there was also similar uh, so that is what i'm trying to do basically like each agent will just be a class and then i can add in the different features like the variables you know, the methods that that agent should be able to do right. so that's of the plan for now Oh, that's great. Well, thank you for the update. Um, look forward to uh, continuing to work on this, and yeah, it's great. So, yeah, this coming week, you plan to do some of those things and get yeah, things. Yeah, I uh, plan to build a few agents and okay. get them to interact with each other. Begin right. that. Sounds good. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, I don't know if. Uh, Aki, did you have an update or Hamanshu? Uh, yes, I do have an update. Okay. So when over the last week, I was working on implementing the mapper algorithm, as I had told in the last meeting. So this is the collab file. It has the code. I would like to show like the visualization that I generated using this. Okay. So uh. I use basically like uh, the code from Himanshu's uh, TDA persistent homology method, like for pre-processing the data. I'm using the same data set. So here I've generated four different type of HTML. Uh, like one is like normal. Uh, it will show just the nodes. This one shows the nodes with 
color functions. This one has uh, node color functions like mean, standard deviation, median, max, and this one has a combination of both. So, so yeah, this would basically look like the visualization would look like this uh, once the HTML files are used on the local server. So, I'm trying to make this a bit more uh, informative and like have to do something about the zone because, uh, like, basically the resolution. So, those are like a few things I need to fix. Other than that, this is uh, what the interactive uh, UI would look like, and here you can change like the uh, yeah. So, like the purple color it shows basically it's like in standard deviation format now and you can also get like the summary of the model like the node distribution and all that so i'm planning on uh, making it a bit more informative like what exactly what everything means right and uh, so yeah so i think this should be done soon and for the next week i'm planning on beginning with the graph neural networks because like I'll have to train the models and all for that. So I'm just going to keep the TDA part aside for a while once this is complete. Then I can maybe get back to it to refine it a bit more. That sounds good. Yeah, so this is uh, generated in uh, like a Mathematica visualization or what was the nice. I can't remember what uh, this is the Kepler Mapper library in Python, oh, okay. which I've used. All right, yeah, okay. I remember this from last summer with uh, Manchu. So that's oh. why. I... <laughs> okay. Yeah, that looks good. Thank you uh, for showing that. Yeah, and of course, that's that's mapping like a lineage tree, which is like a binary tree, to that visualization. So yeah, and then there's this tool, this tool that she's using will allow her to do that. And then that'll, you know, in graph neural networks, what you're doing is you're creating um, uh, network embeddings and you're, uh, you know, selecting on those and visualizing those and things like that. So, uh, or graph embeddings, I guess. And so that that's, you know, that's kind of where that's going. And, and so that that's a good, uh, you know, getting into the visualization part and getting the tools working and all of that. So next, then this coming week, what is your plan? So you're going to do uh, work with the, like you said, with graph neural networks. Yeah, like uh, the dynamic graph, uh, growing graph that I had proposed in my uh, proposal like using the neural developmental program. So I've already uh, been working on like uh, understanding the functions and like kind of tune them to our requirement for our project. So I'll just get back to working on that like where I left off and then get started with that section. All right. That sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, do we have any other updates? Uh, I can share some of my progress, but I don't want to take away time from the uh, the GSOC students. Oh, that's fine. I think we've gone through yeah. everyone. So uh, did him on, uh Did him, I want you? Did you want to go first, or I can? I can. Oh uh... uh, yeah, you can go first. Okay, okay. Because okay. I'm not doing GSOC, so I just don't want to take time away from. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks guys. So, yeah, thank you, thank you for the updates. Those are all really great. Um, so, uh, moving forward with the Breast Cancer Community Tomography Project. So, um, excuse me. Uh, just to recap, just to recap a few things. This is basically the work I'm doing under Dr. Richard Gordon, in which um, we are absolutely trying to enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of uh, breast cancer computed tomography approaches. By combining basically two ways of going about things, X-ray poly polycapillary techniques. Excuse me, um, X a polycapillary approach that that we can use to uh, channel and focus different X-rays for um, controlling beam intensity and resolution. Um, and uh, 
steering them and navigating them with the directional capabilities of the Janospheres for a more comprehensive and, like, say, advanced imaging system for the breast cancer CT technology, okay? So, um, actually, well, okay. Look, re actually, realistically, more accurately, the, the beams that come out are either uh, parallel or focused, and you use that for detecting the tumor. So if you don't know what the tumor is, um, you don't, you, we need to figure out what to use for making the images themselves. So this is a very, very, very pivotal advancement in breast cancer CT screening that is really combining a lot of different areas of work, a lot of different areas of research, like not just me doing the software from like the AI machine learning Monte Carlo simulations of radiation therapy, but, um, you know, trying to, you know, see how well and what ways we can patent this technology together to eventually moving forward. So, uh, right now, um, we're still, I'm still looking into the best tools for simulations. I found out that Blender and Unreal are all right, but ideally there are some more specialized packages. Let me, uh, let me just share my screen, share my tab. There we go. Get. This was probably the best one. Out of the ones I found, okay? Um, for actual, for the actual simulations. Uh, Morgan had mentioned 3D Slicer, 3D Slicer technology for analysis and visualization of the images that are produced. Okay? Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, but Gantz is the one for the actual simulations of the x-rays themselves. So we found out Blender is just not ideal for this. As much as I love messing around with cool things in Blender and making donuts, um, Blender is just not so ideal for physics simulations, whether all these packages and things are they available. So, um, yeah, and this one's uh, open source, free to use. So you don't need a license for anything. Um, so, you know, like it, like, I know it's, it seems like I'm spending a lot of time, like even quite a few weeks, if not maybe over a month at this point, trying to go back and forth between different types of tools, technologies, and software that we need to use. But this is this is basically what's necessary. You really don't want to waste your time collecting tons of data in one or two or one software, and then it turns out you could have been doing something else much better from the beginning. You know, so this is all really, really relevant and ideal for those sorts of things. Uh, so, yeah, moving forward, there are a lot of uh, a lot of things that still need to be done, and I'm really glad, uh, you know, that I can, I can devote a lot of time to this. So this is more or less just my side project, though. You know, there's no no strict obligations, no stipend. So I just work on it voluntarily under uh, Dr. Bill. So, yeah. I think it would be a good idea to try to, if we can produce results and get some reports and results together, to apply for funding, see where things go. I, I suppose that, you know, depending on um, being able to pitch, present the results, and see how things move forward and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you for the update. I know it's hard to find the right software. <laughs> so. Yeah, the, 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 right, the right software, and, and especially even in terms of like, because um, I, I basically spent like quite a few months now talking about how amazing Blender is, and now today I'm coming to you guys and saying, I'm not using Blender, we're not using Blender, <laughs> which is fine, it happens. Yeah. Like, even within art and animation, people have to be pretty damn versatile. Like, the, the actual like, skills you learn, like by using things like Blender and Maya, they're, they can be pretty transferable, but for specific purposes, um, you know, you have to be able to be good with transferring those skills you've learned to different software, different tools. Like the age of uh, a single 3D tool are like like long and gone. It's things are not like that anymore. Um, and in any case, uh, I do really, really, really appreciate 3D Slicer. That's the one that Morgan had put me in touch with. But let me just share the links just so you guys can take a look at this. So this would be a simulation software. We're using. I'm just to keep you posted on the same page. And uh, 3D 3D Slicer is the one we're using. For the actual analyses and uh, visualization. So, um, like, uh, oops. Visualization and, and analysis would include, like, say, statistical stuff, like AI, like the actual machine learning, uh, processing, uh, I guess, uh, we would be solving classification problems as well, too. So, whatever, uh, you know, like, think like, like Kaggle data sets or stuff. Uh, Slicer is really good for that, really great for that. Um, so, ex exciting, exciting stuff and, um, even just like, you know, if anyone has, because because I know this is like pretty unrelated to what everyone else is here is doing with GSOC. This is about some, um, you know, medical physics or I guess uh, ke like chemical physics approaches to breast cancer. Like basically, if anyone has recommendations, and I guess um, you know, like other people to reach out to, groups to reach out to, locations to reach out to, source of potential funding, ways I can push this forward so I can do this while putting food on my table and not just voluntarily. Um, I do. I do work a full time job throughout my day. This is a this is a side hobby, so I'm not dependent on this to to make a living. But you know, 
Yeah. yeah so that's um, <clears throat> another another reason that I, I mentioned them was really just uh, was for the community. You know, because because yeah. there are uh, there are a lot of radiologists <clears throat> that are, are a part of that uh, slicer community. Yeah, yeah. Those would be the, the and you know they do they have regular developer meetings and and regular like um, like uh, showcase um, uh, times too. You know, for for people to you know kind of uh, talk about what they're doing. You know, I, I guess kind of like lightning talks, <clears throat> and um, and like that would be the kind of community that would know that would also know about the grants and the opportunities, and you know, like oh yeah, you know, I I saw somebody at you know X Y Z conference doing something like that. You know what I mean? Like <clears throat> um, definitely definitely a good place to start, and um, and. You know, again, the kind of community that could point you to other communities as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Uh, maybe that, you know, at the very least, like reaching out to individuals, you know, the people who, like I was speaking with an uh, an electronics engineer. He uses Blender for uh, for creating models. Um, he, excuse me. He uses Blender for creating models that he uses in visualization. Um, so, like visualizing things, creating images, creating animations, and artistic stuff for uh, the things that he presents and uses. But he basically um, kind of told me Blender really isn't recommended for uh, for, for simulations at the time for type of reason. So, um, so yeah, like uh, like like he he uses Blender for like um, for certain um, you know like like it's okay. It's 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 just it's just, it's just confusing it's just confusing for me because there are certain types of simulations you can do in Blender, but particularly more so for like mechanical or electrical physics, not for these uh, like X-ray simulation types of things. Okay, that's where I'm getting at here. So just check out the limitations in the software and see what else you can use. Like if you want to simulate like electrical circuits, Blender can be really good for that. If you want to simulate how objects collide, like people use it for like uh, fluid fluid physics simulations all the time too. Uh, not so much for X-ray, X-ray type of so, which is fine. Yeah. We, we, like we had look, we had looked into the actual uh, ability to alter the chemical physics of so like like in Blender you could you could have these meshes and objects and you can control the chemical properties like even simulate say like a uh, a fluid surface for example. But ultimately, if you're doing X-ray simulation, then Blender is not the best for that. So. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's important to find the right tool then what allows you to do what exactly. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty it's pretty mechanical, pretty mechanical. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So and sometimes yeah. problems, you know, they don't have they don't have a software. Like in a lot of the stuff we're doing with graph neural networks, I mean we have tools. Those tools are relatively new. And, you know, there are other tools like for building networks and network theory that don't interface well with what we're, we're developing for graph neural networks. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of a matter of time before that infrastructure gets built out. But That's sometimes exactly. when you're trying to solve a problem, you don't have really good solutions out of the box. You have to kind of put together a pipeline or sometimes even create your own tools, although that's not always good because you have to then maintain it and, and figure out how to build the software itself. Yeah, I mean, like, X, XKCD made a comic about it. It's like, oh, there are all these competing uh, competing different types of tools we can use for something. We should make one that combines them all. And the only thing that happens is they have all their tools plus the one they just made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Time and time again across discipline. That's basically how it happens. So... I know, as speaking as someone who used to work in biotraumatics, this is exa exactly how things were in that in that field. It is it is um, flood, flooded with tools, flooded with tools, flooded with software, flooded with things. But anyways, I think at the very least, since we are basically trying, there, there are two different people, or like a few different people, when you when you're going to be screened for breast cancer, or potentially being you know understood if you uh, your tumors are like benign or malignant or before they metastasize, you know uh, what could be going on, right? There's like the radiologist who looks at the images and analyzes them, and there's the radiation therapist who actually performs the um, 
I think I think they're called radiation therapists, like radi, like 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 radiation therapist who actually performs the like the uh, protocol. They put you under the uh, CT scanner or sometimes the MRI scanner, depending on what you're using. So we are basically trying to replace both of them with our research, and it's a pretty bold goal, a pretty bold initiative. But we'll see where things go. We'll see how things turn out. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. Thanks. Uh, I don't know if Humanchi wanted to go, uh, give an update. Uh, yeah, I'm audible. Yes. Okay, so, like, I would like to start by saying, like, good work from Sara and Paki with the updates, like, uh, for this week, and all the best for their coding period. And, like, I was mainly busy with exams for the past, uh, for the last week. And, uh, like, I also was working on jobs at the same time, so uh, I'm yeah, so uh, I'm happy to say that I'm I'm placed, and it's an SDE role in a company called Browser Stack. Okay. So it mainly is known for handling the testa uh, testing infrastructure of the internet. So basically, they have a lot of customers from all over the globe, and they also. Uh, delve deeply into open source as well, so which is why I'm very excited to work there. Yeah. Well, that's great. Congratulations, Amaji. Yes, thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, so I don't know if Jesse, I know you're at a conference or something today, but did you want to say anything before I move on? Um, not really. Uh, I'm more so at at finals is where I'm really at. Um, so hopefully this is going to be busy. You know, I'm not really going to be. I'm I'm kind of pa pa partially attending and passing by this other stuff that's happening here, but it's it's mostly um, finals time for myself. So hopefully the next after next week. I think I think hopefully by next time we have this meeting I'll be done with the semester. Uh, there's one other thing that might pass beyond that, but it's mostly that. Um, there's a lot. Um, the I, I, I mentioned the link, the Stan Gershman link, and yeah. uh, it's not anything that we don't already know really, but, yeah. but just the points of data management. And I I actually had a, a sort of my additional thought is like, yeah, like data management is important and writing the code. And we know, uh, Sam mentioned um, Patrick Minolts, right? Um, and and it, I think that's a resource we might have talked about before, but he's one with with Neuromatch that's kind of tried to do some good stuff there. And you know, it, it I think I forget if it was Saturday or this this time this meeting last week, but we had a, a nice conversation about. You know, sort of like meta, like meta research or like man research management, and and um, I guess my only real comment right now is um, there's a lot more I want to constructively do in in this space of like from from like very very like uh, well I don't know on one one side of the scale is sort of data management and and how to write, writing good code, writing good documentation, writing notes, and then also like research strategy, and then like managing conferences and events in that space, which maybe is under the education banner of the lab, but also some things I specifically want to do with Joko. Like there's just there's this stuff there, like there's there's materials that we can make and and a lot of things that I feel like are discussions that um could be formalized or just put in other things that I'm looking forward to in the future because I do I do think like I think that's a space that's really difficult to um, there are very few spaces just dis discussing it in, in 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 ways that I well at all if not ways that I I, I like so people have uh, like sort of resources about that. Feel free to put them in, in the Slack somewhere. Um, I saw something about like more decent, decentralized 
one of the D side centralized science stuff. And I was at I was at a, a bio some bio thing from that earlier today or earlier this week. And you know, like uh, oh, one other thing I, I will I will mention, um, kind of on the same note is like um, I I. Uh, I don't know if I can easily share this or not, but um, on I'm not going to bother to share my screen for this, but on on Twitter, which I will probably always call it Twitter, probably out of spite, but I retweeted Sonny Joseph, and on May 14th, she said basically, in Silicon Valley, there's a new cult leader popping up on every block. He quickly reached narrative overexposure. San Francisco is like the Middle East 5,000 years ago, a fiercely competitive market for followers and for faith. Um, so you compare it to Montreal, where she's doing her PhD work and stuff like that. Um, and I'm mentioning that here because um, I, 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 I really like, Sonia's someone I really would like to work with at some point, just because I think she's one of the few people who's really, really, really deep in the weeds technically, but also kind of gets a lot of the narrative stuff going on, and is savvy to, like, wh where I'm going with this whole conversation right now is, um, many people are trying to develop many different things, and we kind of just had this example about, like, tools a few moments ago, but it's sort of also, like, tools and then schools of thought and and you know, conventions that are forming and being full right now. And it's really, it's a really interesting, challenging, I mean, dangerous and, and interesting and exciting and thrilling, whatever, all these different descriptors that you want to use. Uh, because there's just so much that's not really formulated and or standardized or things that are happening that we don't know about. So um, I guess I guess what's on my mind with all that is, um, I, I think some of the work is having these tools or devices or ideas connect to each other and then also almost like um, a skill set for being aware or managing where they go and it's juxtaposed to this the reality you know you have sort of this it, reality of like you're, you're, all, you're ever only one person, and not everybody's going to be trying to be a community leader or a, you know, get a following. But just understanding that there is, like the Sonia tweet, there is a, a, a lot of push for that, like different groups that are really trying to do things, like the bio decentralized science, you have a, a nice concept, you have a more fringe take on it that, that's very, you know, adamant. Uh, about a certain direction or a certain set of tools or using blockchain this way or using this new we're going to update peer review in this way and it's just you know I think I think it's a it's a it's a certain some of it's very niche but some of it's also you know important to talk about in the sense of where is you know, academia or tech management going and what can we do about it so those are just those are passing thoughts for now but um, in the future, I, I'm, I, I definitely want to. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to make like a full working group or something, but, but there's a lot more about this that that uh, I will talk upon, and um, it's a really interesting relation to to just like open source ideas and strategy in general. So uh, that's all. That's my passing thoughts for today. Yeah, that's great. Um, and there's a lot, you know, we can kind of learn from having a overarching strategy of different tool sets and pipelines and things like that. Um, I know that actually with respect to decentralized science, I know the Active Inference Institute is doing work on that. Um, and it's it's kind of a trendy thing. But, you know, these this, these are tools that when a technology emerges, like something like blockchain, you want to figure out how to use it in your research or in your organization. And sometimes that's where toolboxes come from. It's like people say, oh, this is great. This is something that we could use, has a lot of potential. So let's figure out how to use it. 
and then sometimes people use it and they develop something and it's of some type of use. Sometimes it's not very useful, uh, ultimately, but sometimes it's very useful. So you want to take those kind of gambles on new technologies. Um, you know, large language models being another example where we've talked in the, in this group about how you might use it for, you know, well, we're using it now for, um, the open source sustainability thing, but we've also talked about using it for specialized uh, queries on different research fields, like, you know, having a training set on a bunch of papers in a, a niche field, and then, you know, being able to answer questions. If you post questions to the LLM, it'll give you some sort of answer from that literature um, and, and so forth. So, and, you know, what, what is the ultimate use of that? Well, that's what we're doing. <laughs> that's part of research, actually. It's figuring out how useful something is. So that's good. Uh, thank you, Jesse, for that update and, and those words of wisdom. And um, I, I do want to share my screen here. I want to go over a few things. So the first thing is that we have, I wanted to show um, uh, Sarah's blog post. So this is Sarah's blog post. So she's on her uh her personal blog here and she's talking about the beginning of the coding period so this is stage one requirements gathering and preliminary design uh, and if you would like sarah you can uh push this to the uh lab medium uh well i guess it's github io but i don't know if you're using medium um i know you did this before yeah i'll, I'll cross post it to medium as well okay it's written in lockdown so it's quite easy to cancel yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is this is an overview of the different things and, and and challenges that she had in this part of the project. Um, some of the things that were tried out of the box frameworks. Some pros and cons, which I like um, for different tools. Uh, then the execution engines, a llama, a llama file, and this is something you know when you're doing, especially with something like large language models, trying to get them to work locally. Uh, you know, as a challenge. Uh, in last week's Saturday meeting, I did a, a demo of running Olama on a Raspberry Pi, which is a very small powered computer. And so that's something interesting. You know, we want to figure out how to kind of run these different types of software and, and different types of hardware and figure all that out. Um, so, yeah, and then we, you know, again, the design considerations, the framework overview, and, you know, so yes, this is good. Thank you for doing this, and please cross-post this as, as uh, you see fit. The second thing is uh, that Morgan actually, I think, posted on this in, in a Saturday meeting or maybe last Friday, uh, but this is a resource that he found. This is the Software Sustainability Institute. So, you know, our one of our GSOC projects is open source sustainability. This is software sustainability. This is an institute where they kind of focus on this idea of better software, better research. So basically keeping your software sustainable through maintenance, through updating to you know latest features of hardware and, and software languages. Uh, and so this is something, again, with like uh, in research especially, you know, people don't have the resources to go out and, and, you know, update things. In open source organizations more generally, it requires, you know, a special, you know, a special focus on maintaining things long term. So that might require hiring a maintainer. That might require make sure making sure the maintainer has the resources they need. That might require you to have like a, a specific set of standards. So when people move into the, you know, when people leave the organization and new people come in, that those standards are adhered to and that you don't have like, you know, a breakdown of procedure communication so you can maintain your software in in a in an efficient way. Uh, there's a lot to say about like maintenance. I have in my project management course that I teach, I have a whole unit on on sustainability. So this is a very important topic in a lot of projects and a lot of software building. Um, so it looks like they, they do, they sponsor training. 
they have uh, resources for evaluating sustainability. They have uh, different events and you can become a contributor. So, you know, there are other organizations like this. It's nice to see people really kind of focusing on this issue. So finally, I wanted to talk about this. Uh, this is a Medium article uh, by Sylvain Corlet. And this is, I don't know who this person is. I guess they work on this Project Jupiter uh, core, you know, the, the Jupiter notebooks. So the interactive notebooks. Uh, this is Project Jupiter. He's a core developer there. He works on Pi Data. So he works on like developing tools for data science and things like that. So he has this blog and this article called commit. And of course, commit is a technical term we use in GitHub to push something to a repository. You make a, you make a commit if you want to save something in a repository. And we make a pull request to commit a whole bunch or to push a whole bunch of commits to a repository. But the commit is sort of like the least, uh, or maybe like the fundamental unit of open source. Because the commit is the thing you can do to make a change in, say, a document. Um, you know, it might be just like a, fixing a spelling error, or it could be like refactoring an entire code base in a single commit, which isn't something I recommend because you want to have smaller commits, smaller pieces where you don't, like, you know, where you can check, check all of your work, make sure it's what you want, and then push it as some sort of uh, update, you know, so it's if you think about like saving your work, you want to save your work often, but you also want to understand what you've done and like comment on it in the comment of the comment section of the commit. If you go to GitHub, you'll see what I mean. Each commit is like you save it and then you, you know, like tell the maintainer, tell other people in the organization what you did. So this is commit. So this is uh, about long-term consistency and commitment to open source. So there's this commitment aspect of projects. And so sustainability involves keeping the software relevant and keeping the software functional. But it's also about managing teams. And so this post actually talks about uh, how to make sure that teams are sort of sustainable as well as the software. And so he talks about the people behind the projects for this, so he's he's talking in this post about QuantStack, which is this uh, project within Jupiter where they're putting in these features. Uh, let's see. So it is well known that the success of large open source projects often hinges on the dedication of a small distributed group of individuals, and so this is the typical model of open source. At any given time, a small team of maintainers working in a sustained fashion on the project well, a larger group of regular or occasional contributors lend their expertise. So usually we have like maintainers who are accepting pull requests, accepting commits, trying to maintain like a, a project board where issues are generated and making sure that things work. You know, if you, if you have to update your toolboxes, if things, sometimes when you make a pull request or make a commit, there are errors that come back, making sure that those are all within the framework of the project. And then, of course, if you have uh, a lack of documentation, a, a maintainer will tell like a contributor or guide them to the right sort of behavior. So this is where, you know, we get into this, where we have small teams of maintainers, larger teams of uh, contributors. And then if, if there are these long, this, there's this long tail of contributions from those who have encountered issues while using or extending the project and took it upon themselves to improve it. So what he means by long tail is that there are these, there are a lot of contributors who ver contribute very little overall to the project in terms of content, in terms of commits, uh, but they actually add a lot of value because they're just basically coming in and saying, look, I tried to run this and it doesn't work. Here's my fix. And then it gets accepted. Or I've maybe created a small change, maybe to install this on a Mac or something else. And so there are different ways you can, you know, that these kind of contributions come to be. Um, and then, 
Uh, so projects. I'm just, just seeing what that would do. I don't know what actually make it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, projects like Jupiter, with millions of end users worldwide, are a testament to the power of this model. So, in, in this Jupiter project, they're doing, they're kind of working within this framework, and they have millions of users. So, they have a lot of potential contributors. It's hard to imagine a proprietary software application used at such an extensive scale, thriving with such limited resources. So in open source projects, we often have sparse resources, but we can make them work because we have these distributed uh, you know, contributors. And it really comes from the user base, which is the most valuable thing of all. Because as we've seen, you know, we're using the software for different things, and it allows for customization and ultimately making it part of like kind of the user base's needs. It, it matches their needs. Um, and so this just basically what he's talking about here is he wants to sort of make sure that the burden of this entire enterprise doesn't fall on the shoulders of a few individuals. And so sometimes that happens in a lot of open source projects. You get a case where everyone says it's someone else's responsibility, say, to be a maintainer or to make improvements to the software. And so at some point, either you get only a few people who do all the work, or no one does the work and the project fails. So he has this image here of someone rolling a rock up a hill like Sisyphus, and it's really about someone trying to make that moonshot, but then they're rolling the, this boulder up the hill, and they have this, they're, they, they're alone in the burden. So we want to make this burden this less burdensome for people. So he talks about long-term consistency. Now the Jupiter project has a large scope. So, you know, you have some projects are extremely large in scope uh, where you have, you know, sometimes you have to shift resources, shift human uh, resources and things like that. Teams like that of QuantStack has been well positioned to tackle the kind of endeavor where you have different challenges at different times and sometimes maintainers need to be intensely involved, and other times they don't. So this is uh, where he talks about building Jupiter Labs Visual Debugger. So this required a team effort, and this required this sort of flexible distributed team effort. And so he talks about how, you know, just working on the visual debugger of Jupiter Lab, they needed to make modifications to the kernel protocol, implement, implement a modified protocol in a Jupiter kernel kernel, tweak the Jupyter server, and develop the debugger's front-end in Jupyter Lab. So this means that you're working for multiple repositories, you're working with people with diff many different areas of expertise, and then you also need to have the community's consensus on what these changes are. So, you know, when you start a project in a community like that, and it affects a lot of users, you need to tell people what you're doing tell them what, you know, ask them maybe what they prefer in terms of, you know, what kinds of changes would be best for you? What kinds of changes don't you want? And then the team has to take that into consideration and build the tool and release it. So to ensure that we could deliver a functional debugger within the time frame expected. So sometimes you have funding constraints or expectations. So people don't want to wait three years maybe for a debugger. Maybe everyone else in your area has a debugger and you're working on a project where you're trying to compete with other types of notebook and you don't have a debugger and you can't take three years to build one in. Maybe it needs to happen in an expedited fashion. So those are all constraints that you have working against you. And so, you know, you just really need to kind of not only focus on the software engineering, but also the social uh, aspect of it as well. So he talks about this challenge and how this has worked. And of course, then this, this led to the release of Notebook version 7. And so this is where uh, they, in 2023, they basically did this version 7 of Jupyter Notebook, which was a complete overhaul of the project. This new notebook reuses components of Jupyter Lab to create a new version of the classic Notebook UI. Notebook version 7 and Jupyter Lab nearly operate from the same code base. But they made a lot of improvements, such as having support for the visual debugger, having different types of themes, having different kinds of language packs, allowing for collaborative editing. 
and then making accessibility improvements, which are always things that people want, but sometimes aren't at the front of their mind, or it isn't like something where uh, like 80% of the users would want. It's maybe where 10% of the users would find it extremely useful and everyone else, it doesn't really matter. But in a project like this, as opposed to like a, a proprietary project, uh, you can do those sorts of things that serve 10% of your community or 10% of your users. And that's that's sort of a priority. And it becomes a priority and you can devote resources to it. So that's a benefit of open source. And so, but you have to be able to manage your project in such a way so that is to make that happen. And you don't want to overburden certain people with the responsibility for it. You want to break up the responsibility across the entire team. So he talks about this, how, you know, the maintenance burden has been significantly reduced with a lot of these updates as well. So you don't need to burden the maintainers down, down the line as the project ages. So yeah, he gets into a lot of good stuff in this article and talking about the specific experience at Jupiter. And then he kind of shows how when you're successful in this endeavor, you end up planting the flag on the top of the hill, you were rolling the rock up and you succeed and you build this great thing that people can use. And best of all, there isn't any, there isn't a lot of technical debt or uh, maintenance cost later on. So you can maintain this project over the long term. Okay, I think that's all I had to say on that article. Um, did we have any questions or comments before we go? Yeah, so um, one thing that I talk about with a lot of my colleagues in terms of like open source contributions is, uh, you know, they're obviously very valuable, very, um, uh, a few things we talk about. First of all, you know, we, we a lot of us find it difficult to get work done. Like when, when we're in these positions and in these areas to get work done, it's basically more or less voluntary to, to get people to work on projects that aren't yours. And having contributions are really, really great, and they do look valuable, but it's, um, you know, we'd be doing a lot of work that's voluntary and basically not compensated. Do you know, like, within the open source communities and open source, um, like, okay, within open source communities, open source projects, open source initiatives, how we can uh, get some lots of, uh, of people to basically be motivated and incentivized to get on board? I know, especially for us, even working remote projects through our startup, through our educational and technology company, no, no one's going to do anything. No one's going to do anything on remote work where you have global people globally involved to get involved in their efforts. No one's going to do anything unless, unless they have something that really, really, really strongly incentivizes them to do what they need to do on their individual basis. And there are a lot of difficulties with this too, especially with open source work, because it's like, well, even if I get a lot of work done on this project, if no one else is pushing it forward. Where, where are my commits and where are my edits and issues raised and stuff going, really, too? Yeah. Um, do you have any, like, general recommendations how, how we as open source contributors, like, within our houses and doing these global projects, how we can, like, balance that or stay incentivized and motivated while, um, you know, I, I know even with me conducting remote projects where I get people involved across the world, you know, it's, it's tough, like, um, unless they're, like, there's no con contractual obligation for them to work with me, so. Yeah, I mean, it is a struggle. And sometimes it's, like I said, sometimes a lot of your contributors are refractional. So it's like something in their self-interest they contribute and that's it. And that, that motivation is just restricted to that thing that they're contributing. And it's usually something they're highly interested in. It wouldn't get done any other way. Sometimes a lot of open source organizations have a foundation. They have money and they pay maybe like their maintainers. Or they're maybe key contributors, people who spend a lot of time on the project. But of course, a lot of foundations have to have the money in the first place. So it's, you know, it's like there's fundraising, there's like, you know, keeping people's self interest up, or at least their motivation up in terms of is this useful to them. So then, you know, that's where the democracy part comes in and saying, what is most useful to you? Don't necessarily say, well, we're going to drive the project based on. Um, you know, what we think we need to do. I mean, we obviously have things we need, but how do you want to do this so that you get something out of it? 
Is it skills that you're looking for? Is it like maybe your, uh, is it a personal thing for your other projects that might be helpful? So if someone's working on some code base, it might be helpful in their other projects. And so doing so wouldn't be such a burden because they'll reuse this stuff anyways. And so this is, uh, you know, there are a lot of strategies for both monetary and non-monetary to get people to keep people motivated. As for like people who just contribute to open source, a lot of times it's like reciprocation. So like you're gaining skills and the organization is gaining some code or something. But, you know, and then of course you can use it on your resume and say, I contributed to this open source project. That's like skill building. Um, other than that, you know, it's it's like, yeah, there <laughs> people haven't really worked out good uh, techniques for this. And that's one of the reasons why open source has problems with like projects failing and there's a big problem with motivation that hasn't yeah i mean it's it, it is what it is even like like psychologically you know you see the studies of the monkeys that are taught to paint because they love it because painting is so fun and they make these great paintings and they just love it it's like oh i love paint that's so cool all of a sudden when the monkeys start getting paid to paint they don't want to do it anymore they don't they don't enjoy it they really don't um but alternatively when it comes to work for us as people a lot of times we feel as though, like if I were to even ask people in the lab, like, hey, let's get a paper together, but there's no compensation for it, or rather people, there's no incentivize for it. I'm saying it's just voluntary. It can be, it can be difficult to get that done. It can be really, really difficult to get that together too, you know? So there's, there's these, there's these trade-offs, there's these different concepts of stuff between things, you know? So like, um, you know, it just, yeah, yeah. I think, I think in general, um, if you can at the very least show that you're willing to do work that's voluntary, that almost paradoxically speaks to employers that you're a very, very hardworking, like disciplined person who's passionate about what they want to do for its own sake, which is really, really great. But the, you know, obviously the paradox and the trade off to that is like, how do you get people on board to want to do that? Like, you want to just get people, you know, like, I know, and especially with our company, with our startup, like, if, like, I know, I know for one thing in software and tech and stuff like that, if someone approaches you and say, work for me for free, you know, head for the house, don't do that. And you need to make sure that whatever contract you sign is like like ironclad, like like by the book, like it is safe and legitimate for to to receive compensation for what you do. So, you know, that's that's what I'm saying. So right. yeah. Um the only other thing that comes to my mind, and it's come up here in in the lab and other things too, is like there's something to be said. We know I know we're kind of yeah we're we we were past time, so I'll be very brief. I'm gonna just allude yeah. to it. And if we want to talk about this later, like I'm most happy to talk about this like in, in the Slack or or in future conversations. <laughs> but um, I think there's a lot to be said about community management, vision management. And regular giving people opportunities to stay incentivized, and what, what like the like the participation structure. Like, there's a lot to be said about what we're doing in the lab or not to those ends. I know there are other other groups, but it's sort of like I think as basically in the commit post we talked about earlier, you know, you kind of have a you, there, and there's like as a manager of it, you kind of have to. This, there's a lot of calculation you're doing for what someone's involvement, like how, how worth it is it to try to really stoke the fire for certain people or groups or projects? And how do you, how do you deal with momentum and focus? Like there's a whole lot, uh, to like just the, the management. And that's kind of, you know, goes back to what I was saying in my earlier comments about like, there's a lot of strategy there too. And I, I actually, with a Joe Pro mentoring thing, I'm going to, I'm going to develop part of a program like for mentors for mentors or or people doing the management work not just mentees but like that's the space that's also i think for lack of better terms we'll often say like that's an underserved or underdeveloped space uh, yep. so it's important um for sure so I'll, I'll leave it at that. And, and, like, and, and once again there, there are trade-offs with how people psychologically um you know view and value those things like if i said you know just just work for me for free for its own sake no one's going to want to do it but like if you charge for it, you know, people on some level psychologically will start to value that too. So it just really depends. So I don't yeah. I know we're over time, so I don't need to keep talking about this. But it, it is important. All right. Another 
right? Yeah, it, it just like a small thing that I wanted to add. I don't know how much this plays into like actual real or uh, big open source communities, but like one form of incentivization that I have personally experienced uh, in the sort of like the voluntary involvement in college clubs uh, that I think translates in some level is the incentivization to kind of uh, give back what you've gotten like even as jesse mentioned the mentor mentee relationship so a lot of times like college clubs that have been part of uh, there is a lot of voluntary work done all the way from the management aspects to organizing to technical without any sort of compensation uh, and i think one of the main motivators for that is the fact that someone did it before you and you know, because someone organized a workshop, say, before you, that you were allowed to participate in, you now have the resources to do that for someone else. And at least in a, in, in like an academic community where you don't really, you're not really thinking about compensation at that because of the age as well. I think that is kind of quite enough of a motivator. So I believe, I do think it translates to open source communities in some ways with maybe the one might not be that strong, uh, but I think it does. Yeah, and, and like there's a like there's a lot to say about like plot posters because for largely largely speaking, that was that was sort of um, that was the core of it. But now, as things change and expands, uh, incentive structures can change too. But you're you're totally right. Uh, I think we can talk more about the. Yeah, yeah, we can talk more about it uh, later in Slack or wherever. Um, but thank you for attending the meeting and uh, a lot of good conversation. And uh, see you next week. All right, take care, thank everybody. You. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.